Hey guys, welcome to the Google Podcast. I am your host, Rob Watson, and I've got a, a brilliant guest lined up for you today. His name is Hugo Tagholm. He is the Chief Executive of Surface Against Search, which is a national marine conservation and campaigning charity that inspires, unites, and empowers communities to take action to protect oceans, beaches, waves, and the wildlife as well. So thank you, Hugo, for agreeing to chat with me today. Oh no, thanks very much for, for having me, um, and thanks for that kind introduction. Um, Really delighted to talk to you today. Yeah, it's great. I've, um, I've known about you guys for a few years now and I've been very aware of what you've been doing and the amazing, you know, the amazing impact you've been doing. But for those who aren't aware of it, even though I've just given a little bit of an introduction, do you mind just telling us a little bit more about Surface Against Sewers? That'd be great. Absolutely. Well, I've been, I've been uh, running the charity for about 12 years now. Um, and uh, as our... Um, our name is somewhat of a sort of a misnomer these days. Um, we, we have as an organisation been going for sort of 30 years, but we started back in the 1990s as a single issue pressure group uh, working on, um, working on the, the, the water quality issue, hence the name. Um, it was started by surfers um, and it was focused on the big sewage issue of the 1990s, um, which it worked on really successfully and campaigned around very successfully. Now, um, over the sort of the, the last three decades, it's evolved into a much broader marine conservation charity, and particularly over the last 10 years, um, um, since we've sort of grown into a, a, a national charity um, with various interests. And we work particularly um, um, with uh, sort of four issues, plastic pollution being one of the top issues, which is what our supporters and the general public have been particularly engaged with over the past three or four years, but we've been working on it for 10 years now, just over 10 years. Uh, we work on climate change, the biggest issue, climate and oceans, is a really big theme for us. And um, the oceans are both at the sort of heart of the impacts of the change of climate, but also really at the heart of potential solutions for for um, for sort of the recovery of of, of, plan, uh, of the planet um, or planetary systems. Um, we're working on water quality issues still um, with um, sort of beach water quality, but increasingly with river water quality too, where people interact with the ocean, whether it's for surfing, swimming. Um, going on holiday, whatever it might be. Um, and then sort of lastly, we're very much involved in the rewilding sort of agenda and the rewilding of our oceans. How can we do that better? How can we make it more understandable for people? How can we engage people with actions around the rewilding of our ocean and the observation of how we can help our ocean recover, which is so topical at the moment, particularly as we see sort of um, some habitats sort of recovering as, as, as the pressures ease on them. Um, so yeah, we're a broad marine conservation charity. Um, we, uh, we work with a lot of sort of volunteers, so our, our sort of model is about empowering people. And um, we're a very small charity, we're 27 people. Um, but we work with hundreds of thousands of volunteers every year. We empower them to take part in beach cleans, to plastic free communities, to um, do all sorts of things in schools. Um, and of course, come on the campaign trail with us to campaign in Westminster, to push politicians and businesses to do the right thing, to protect our ocean for now and for the future that sounds amazing and what i like about that as well you got the balance right in terms of empowering the communities to get involved but also actually putting pressure on governments and being able to create some policy change because it kind of has to go hand in hand because it almost you know i was reading i think it was something you shared on twitter about you know some of the is it the four world's largest users of plastic and it's coca-cola pepsi unilever yeah. and nestle's and you know we can we can do as much as we can personally, but unless we can actually put some pressure on them to be more responsible, I think it was half a million tons of plastic that is a burn. Yeah, I mean it's a good point. I mean in our sector, and there are you know there are you know of course it's degrees of sort of belief in any model, but there are people who believe in a you know simply just just the bottom up approach that people power will will you know individual behaviour change will solve the planet's problems. Um, there are other people who believe that it's absolutely up to big government to sort out the problems and big industry. And we, we think it's neither one nor the other. It's a combination. We need to empower lots of people to create a voice. Um, not so much about their individual actions. They're each important, but we can't, you know, we're not going to change the systems we live in just by, you know, deciding to, to use a, a bamboo toothbrush. But if lots of people take these actions, if lots of people come to beach cleans, if lots of people collect evidence with us at the beachfront, we can create a united voice, a voice for the ocean, that then government will listen to very um, seriously. And as we found over the 
last 30 years. And when we do that, then we can create pressure for the government to change legislation and policies that can stop businesses from potentially polluting how they are. Um, it could uh, change the frameworks we live in to give us more sustainable options in our day-to-day -day lives, all of those things. So we need, we need both things to connect as a bottom, you know, bottom up and a top down approach. Um, and we like it, it's a po positive pyramid scheme. People get together, we empower a lot of people and we amplify their voices, um, particularly through our Ocean Conservation All Party Parliamentary Group, which we help run in Westminster um, with members of parliament. And that is a great place for us to have really serious discussions about the challenges facing our ocean and the ways that people can be involved and the things that we'd love to see the government introduce more quickly, change, um, change the way we're living on, on planet ocean. Um, often, often big business wants, wants sort of change to come. They always talk about behavior change being about just individuals, about you or me or the people listening, it's about every individual, everyone should change their behavior. And I believe people should change their behavior and we all try and adapt. We change what we're eating, whether we become vegan, flexitarian, whatever it might be, um, change those habits. Um, whether it's the products we buy, whatever it might be. Um, but actually behavior change is, is something we need to see across all actors in our society. We need businesses to change their behavior. We need governments to change their behavior. Because what we know is that business as usual on planet ocean is destroying our, our world. It's destroying the way um, the, 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 the ecosystems around us and the very life support machine that we rely on, which is, which is nature really. And we're part of nature. We're not separated from nature. We are fundamentally, um, you know, you know we're, we're just other animals on the planet. And um, we need to we need to accept that we need to accept that we can't we can't separate ourselves from from the, the natural processes that are so vital for our existence and for the existence of every living thing on the planet. Yeah, absolutely. And I was looking at some of the figures, which are pretty astounding, really, when you think about you know a plastic bottle that can last potentially 450 years. It gets used. You know what? Someone might drink it. It's gone in 15 minutes, and then it's disposed of. And if it's not disposed of correctly, and it washes back up on the beach, or ends up there, and then breaks down, you know, 450 years. You know, yeah, it's crazy. And to think we use almost 40 million plastic bottles every, you know, every day in this country, and only half of them end up in recycling. And whether they actually, you know, end up getting recycled is another question at the moment. Um, and there are incredible things to try and change that happening at the moment. Movements, you know, people, you know, refilling their water bottles, um, you know, in, in, their, in their hundreds of thousands now, in their millions, maybe. Um, people refusing, you know, refusing to take plastic water bottles right, left and centre. Festivals like Glastonbury getting rid of them, that sort of stuff. It's great to see. I think we also need to be sort of conscious in this day and age of, of, of you know, where we can take, you know, refilling to a, the stage and where we also need to go well what you know, what packaging are we going to have what's the packaging mix we're going to move forward with in the future and how we, how can we create much more efficient recycling that doesn't offshore our plastic that keeps it in the uk and creates green jobs where we can create a circular economy is it better to have glass bottles in some cases is it better to have aluminium cans in others is it better just to say we can't have some soft drinks all of these things. So there's lots of questions that go with it because we also, as environmentalists, we're also very conscious that in this world we live in, this modern world, there are good, there's going to be a packaging mix around us. And how do we not throw the baby out with the bathwater? How do we end up with the, the most sustainable, the least impacting on our planet and ocean model that is truly circular and, um, and prevents you know, billions of bits of plastic from getting into our environment or other packaging every year? And, um, and polluting you know, not only the space that we love, but killing wildlife and ultimately polluting the systems that we really rely on, whether it's the water system or the air that we breathe, all of those things. So um, it's a really interesting and complex debate. Um, and uh, we're, we're you know, thrilled to sort of be part of it and, and to, um, to bring so many people along on that journey with us. Um, we were very sort of pleased with the, um, the deposit return work we did um, 350,000 people signing our petition to, uh, to, um, to, to get a deposit return system in this country on plastic bottles. 
create a much tighter circular economy to deliver much more efficiency in our recycling system and to make sure that we're not polluting um, far off countries whilst thinking we're doing you know doing really well with our, our our protection of nature so that was that was great and took us from the beachfront where we collected the evidence right to 10 downing street deliver the, the petition and have conversations with the prime minister's team about about the the, the need for a deposit return system so um those sort of amazing things that always start for us always start with what we see on the beach everything that we do from when we started back in the 1990s was always geared up around people's experiences um, at the beach whether it's surfing in sewage whether it's walking across tide lines filled with plastic whether it's seeing a development that you you think is in the wrong place and causing some damage whatever it may be these are these are all rooted in very authentic and real experiences that, that our supporters and my team sort of has around the country. Yeah, and when you just talk about that, like sewage in the sea, some people might be listening to this. And even myself, when I started doing research this a few years, I didn't realise how much actually will get pumped in at times. And the Yeah, I mean, look, it's not as bad as it may have been in the 1990s. You know, not as many continuous, you know, there are no continuous discharges as there were there on the sort of long, you know, long long outfalls that went into the sea but sewage pretty much goes into our rivers and sea every day um, there are thousands of combined sewer overflows impacting bathing waters and beautiful rivers and all sorts of spaces that we love and whilst the water industry has a plan water companies have a plan and they make investments there's still far too much impact in our opinion we we think that there is too much pollution going in there's too much um there's too much um, misreporting of what um, is going into our ocean from the water companies. And we need more transparency. We need more urgency to give us the right information all year round around sewage discharges. And we need much more investment to stop um, the pollution that we see um, right around the UK um, that still exists in our, in, in our um, bathing waters. So they're all work in progress. There have been some big bits of investment that have done a lot of good things. But we will need more, particularly as population grows, our weather patterns change due to climate change. More and more people are using the ocean, you know, year round in, in the brilliant wetsuit technology we now have. So these, these spaces we, we are trying to protect are vital to the health of individuals, of communities, of businesses. You know, these unique beaches where people congregate to, to have fun well at the moment of course given we're in the COVID-19 crisis people can't congregate in these spaces but but these are really really important community spaces where where um can't really put a monetary value on them the health and well-being benefits the the uh the social cohesion that they can bring um and um we need to fight for them harder than ever before to make sure they're protected for now and forever you just mentioned COVID-19 in the end, but this is recorded on the 2nd of April. So who knows what the world will look like when this actually gets out there. But it's interesting. And I think it's with the plastic pollution. I know it's been really, you know, David Attenborough's done a lot of work around this the past few years, really bringing a lot of to the forefront. You know, you've got Extinction Rebellion, which you're doing incredible work the past year or so. And mm -hmm. when we do go to the beaches, even when we just go out to our parks, we're seeing how much rubbish there is. And because... You know, maybe going back in time, maybe 20, 50 years ago, it maybe didn't necessarily, people maybe didn't think it mattered as much, but because there's 7 billion people, there might be 10 billion people at some point. That means there's 10 billion people to be fed. And if we don't have the right systems in place, then, you know, we're going to go down, a, we're going down some dark paths and we'll see what happens from COVID-19 and how, you know, that can potentially rebalance us in some ways, get us to be a bit more conscious. It's certainly slowing down industry. And I know, obviously we're, we're living in a time where it's very uncertain and there's going to be, you know, unfortunately a lot of people are losing their lives and that just cannot be underestimated. And, um, but on the other side of it as well, we are being maybe a bit more conscious of stuff and being aware of like, I think was it the other week I've seen about in Venice, you've got like turtles and or dolphins yeah. appearing in the waterways in California. Now yeah. the smog think, is, is lifted. It's um, I think you've got to, I mean, there's a lot to sort of unpack with, with what you sort of just said, um, because, you know, let's just sort of, I mean, let's, let's start with sort of coronavirus there. I think, um, you know, first of all, it's the 2nd of April and we're in the sort of beginning of, you know, a very serious part of the global pandemic. 
um, with a lot of people losing their lives, which I think we need to have at the forefront of our minds and our incredible NHS workers and the, the frontline um, responders to this, whether they're teachers in our schools looking after the children of um, NHS workers, whether it's our police force, whether it's our fire services, or the people in our supermarkets that are doing an incredible job to keep the nation fed and make sure our supply chains are strong. So my sort of thanks and sort of my sort of my sort of mind is is sort of with those people first and foremost because because they're doing a, an incredibly difficult job and in some cases putting their lives on the line for the health of others. So so sort of hats off to them um, for their courage and their their energy uh, during this really tough time. And uh, you know, I'm think of all of the people who have sort of lost their jobs overnight and who can't pay their mortgages or feed their children easily. And um, that is a very challenging situation to face. But um, as you say, there are some interesting things um, from the environmental point of view. Um, and I think we, we've got to be careful with some of those because we don't want the sector to be sort of painted as a sector that, that doesn't want us to live our lives in a normal way, connected with each other, doing things we love to do, accessing nature, um, you know, buying things that we need um, and, you know, experiencing the world in a sort of modern way. Um, but there are there are signposts with this of how if we take pressure off nature it can flourish quite quickly um, if we um, if we sort of put that into this context of our our calls um, to protect and highly protect 30 percent of our ocean by 2030 um, then we see that 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 sort of becomes more of a reality if we can really take a you know take pressure off species and ecosystems in our ocean then they can come back and if we were to protect fully sort of 30% of our land and ocean in a radically enforced way, you know, that may be the generator we need for the, the human population to thrive in the rest of the world. Um, you know, the rest of the world being the 70% that's then left over for us to, to do, you know, to, to, to live our modern lives in. So I think there are really interesting indicators there. Um, and and we should we should use this period as a period of sort of reflection to collect that evidence to 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 crunch the data from it to look at what the drivers truly were and to see how we need to sort of reshape industry repurpose industry reevaluate our own lives what we're grateful for the things that we have um the food that we are you know blessed to have um you know coming into our houses every day the interactions we have with people be more grateful and an and understanding of the, the, the sort of good fortune we have and maybe to, to change our lives and this is a good example Rob you know, you know maybe a few months ago we might have said look if we're going to do this podcast let's let's meet in person to do it and I might have jumped on a train to come and see you or or jumped in my car to come and see you or vice versa and actually we can we can do it like this and we can connect very well through zoom and we can um and we can, you know, we can achieve what we need to achieve with minimal sort of impact, um, but still get the same results. So there's going to be so many things that we we, we find out from this crisis. Um, there'll be initially there's great many challenges, and they won't just be the short term, and that's for human life and human, you know, um, sort of suffering and, and economies. But there will be other things that we can take um, take away that will be positives and sort of learnings for the future. And so we should we should be inspired by that, um, but respectfully um, at the right time when we can, you know, truly, truly take that evidence in a sensitive sort of way. I think also you sort of mentioned the sort of feeding the sort of planet and, the, you know, the plastic, you described it as, as rubbish. Um, and you sort of, sort of compared it to the last 20, 30 years. Now, I think, you know, what we've seen is, is a completely different, you know, I hear a lot of sort of older people, potentially my parents' generation or quite a few people I might see in Parliament going, oh, this was never, it was never like this in my day. The park was perfectly clean and no one ever dropped litter. We all really well behaved. And it's like, well, look, you know, then there were no, there was no Costa Coffee. There was no pret manger There was no McDonald's. There was no Burger King. There was no food on the go. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a, a thing. And so that is a thing now, and everyone has that in their hands. What, and so the whole industry has boomed around, look, this is how we can, these are new things we can do with people, and this is how we feed people, and this is how people have to eat because they're really busy, can only run along eating a sandwich for 
20 minutes at lunchtime, they don't stop and sit down together over a table in the local cafe or pub or restaurant or wherever they may be or at home, they, they, they eat on the go. And so it's a whole different sort of different industry. And that industry has developed really, really fast in terms of the products they want us to buy. But they haven't developed the systems to contain and control or own the waste that they generate with that. So the, the, the park bins that we have today are probably pretty much the same as the park bins we had in the 1960s and 70s that did the job for the community then and for the lack of food on the go. And suddenly, of course, there's a lot more what we would call plastic pollution in the environment because the systems aren't fit for purpose to contain that waste stream. Um, and for us, you know, whilst some people are literate, the truth of the matter is, this is really the responsibility of the big international brands and the big multinational companies that, that really drive the manufacture of this stuff. They need to have full life cycle responsibility for their packaging because then they will put the, the systems in, in place to reprocess and hopefully recycle and reuse that packaging in the most efficient and effective way possible that protects their bottom line. On that then, on the big businesses, what's, what do you think needs to be done to actually get them to change? Because obviously it's, we're based in a system, a well, capitalist system, which could, many people could say it's become like a bit of a mutant form of capitalism, you know, money, profit at all costs, based on a system, on a world you know, with infinite growth, when we've got finite resources, you know, we can't just continue to take, take, take. And then it's not only taking it, it's how we're then putting it back. It's kind of just like take, and then who cares where it gets dumped? You know, like as we mentioned before, Coca-Cola, Unilever, and them, you know, half a million tons worth of stuff. You know, what, um, what, what do you think needs to happen on their level? Well, look, I think, I think we're often told that in our industry to, you know, to collaborate with people. And that's the right thing to do to create sort of efficiencies and shared goals. Um, as individuals, we're sort of told sort of to, to, to follow new, you know, new systems and adhere to, um, to, to um, you know, to rules and regulations. I think what I hear from, from business often is, is, is a lot of messaging that confuses the market they come up with their own incentivized recycling schemes where if you buy more cans of their product and take five back, you'll then you know, get some benefit and they create their own compartmentalized system. Actually, what we need to see is a shared system across these big companies and um, for them to really invest in a, a one unified deposit return system that has the most benefit for, for, for nature. The ultimate outcome should be, the ultimate metric for that, the measurement should be, right, we have no more plastic bottles in the environment or drinks cans in the environment, for example. You know, where they keep inventing new, new schemes amongst certain small number of businesses or new initiatives to incentivize their customers buying more of their stuff, they're confusing the, the market and confusing the opportunity to do something that really brings people together and so i think um now what we need to see is really the commitment and it may be just driven by government legislation as is hopefully going to be the case when deposit return systems come on on online in in scotland first and then the rest of um, england and, and the whole of the uk ultimately um you know r really often it's driven by legislation and policy that government have to sort of um have to implement for business to do the right thing but it would be nice to see businesses sort of abandoning some of their competitive advantage to go that we have to create a shared system that enables us to continue functioning in a much more sustainable, you know, and function in a much more sustainable way. Uh, an example that sort of comes to mind is, and I think they are exploring this to an extent, is coffee cups. Now, you know, we all try and refill our coffee cup if we want a coffee on the go. You now I've got, got you know, in my, probably a couple, two full of refillables actually. Um, but, um, but, you know, we should really have the coffee chains going, well, let, let them all share the same cups that can be, you know, given back and used by any of the, the, the shops that they, that you have to pay a deposit on and you can take it back into any of the shops. They lose the brand advantage of having their own branded paper cups and you know, their own colorways, but they, they actually then reduce the wastage and you can be confident of picking up your coffee in a, 
you know, dare I say, a Starbucks and then dropping the cup back off at Pret and it, it matters not. It's up to them to create the, the really refillable system that we can all use um, because I take it the worst is, you know, people like us will, will refill our water bottles and cups. Not everyone will do it and, and a lot of people will be, you know, be out and about and want something that they don't have a refillable for. So, so I think it's incumbent on big business to, to change the systems that they have and the shared systems they have and for government to push and create the conditions for it to be an even playing field for all businesses to actually deliver that together because then then uh, then it's not a penalty to to, to any business it's just a, a new playing field for them all to operate with i think a good example is a few years ago when you know plastic plastic bags in supermarkets pretty much stopped overnight and the the effect i don't know how many it's something like so many billion a month or something crazy like that you might know the actual figures um, yeah, well, it's been amazing. The plastic bag, I mean, that, again, it, it's driven by legislation, as I think you were sort of coming on to. You know, we, we campaigned with some other organisations, with Greenpeace and with um, the Marine Conservation System and others to, to, to get that legislation, um, you know, which at the time industry really didn't want, you know, five, you know, five, and they thought it was going to be a really sort of punitive and difficult thing for customers. Um, they, uh, they were against it. Um, and of course, it's it sort of come into force um, to some sort of quite considerable resistance uh, the legislation, and it's had a massive impact. It's reduced the circulation of plastic bags by almost 20 billion, I think, maybe more now. Um, you know, which would take an awful long time to pick up out in the environment if they were polluting the environment. And um, and it's changed people's sort of view on on you know their own personal sustainability ecosystem. It's probably the first of the bits of sort of plastic legislation and campaigning that was really, you know, about refilling. It's like, here's your bag and you're going to refill it every time you go to the supermarket. And it's, it's been one of the most successful pieces because of legislation. So it wasn't just overnight behavior change from people. It was about government changing its behavior and its view on the legislation it needed to then make sure they put the right legislation in place to get business to change how they did things. Um, are you not giving out plastic bags for free anymore and charging people five pence? Um, and then consumers being able to benefit from that by, you know, um, you know, saving themselves a bit of money by not, you know, by, by taking their own bags, having a, a, a personal responsibility over their own environmental sort of footprint. Um, so being able to think about that every time they went to the supermarket, um, but then also not being penalized if, if, you know, uh, Know an, old, you know, an old lady or a, a young family at the supermarket and forgot their bags, they could still access those things and then remind themselves that they shouldn't do that very, very much when they got sort of home. So it's sort of a, a win-win. There could have been a ban. Um, potentially that would have been resisted much more strongly by industry and then nothing would have happened. I think this has been a good sort of outcome. It then has what I think people would refer to as sort of a spillover effect into other behaviours. So if people are starting to think about their sustainability with plastic bags, they might start to make other considerations and take action in other ways around their environmental footprint. So we were delighted with that. And I think it's a good example to draw out because again, it, it, it brings this behavior change thing back to the forefront of people's minds. Um, people mustn't forget that that came about because of a lot of campaigning from a lot of great organizations that delivered the legislation to create the behavior change to flow down from government to business to people. And it was the same with things like the seatbelt, you know, seatbelt legislation, you know, how people view seatbelts. Everyone, of course, wears them because they don't want to get fined. They don't also want to get thrown through their windscreen or, or whatever. But it was legislation that came in that, that put the laws in place. The same with the smoking ban. You know, people smoke outside because there's a, you know, legal enforcement of not being able to smoke inside. It wasn't just a choice by pubs to suddenly go, we we're not going to allow people to smoke inside. And if it was, there'd still be lots of pubs where people would probably smoke inside and there'd be smoking pubs right, left and centre. So, you know, really good big bits of behaviour change across society, I think, follow a similar model. There's an issue in society, whether it's plastic pollution or people, you know, losing their lives because of, you know, not wearing seatbelts. And there's a public upright rising against that. There's public opinion that starts to go against the current status quo of legislation and, 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 and how we behave in society that rises up to government who hear it stronger and stronger and they start thinking we better act on this because it's one of the things that people care about most so it means 
whether we're potentially elected or stay in power or not. And, um, and then they, they, they introduce the, the, the legislation as a response to that, which then influences how we all sort of behave. So there's, there's quite a sort of, sort of system around that, a sort of an approach around that. And I'm glad to see it happening more and more on other, you know, on other bits of, of, bits of, of, of the environmental um, work that we, we do. And on plastics, particularly, we've got legislation coming on, or, you know, deposit return systems. We've got legislation on banning straws and stirrers and cotton bud sticks. Work so hard on. So, um, so it's good to see society starting to shift in the right direction. And what I take from that as well is like, you know, obviously it goes hand in hand with changing corporations outlook and also changing government. But it seems to be like a lot of it, like what the work that you're doing, it's affecting people on an individual level to say, you know, we need to make the change there. And it almost becomes like that hundred monkey effect when enough of us do it, then other people start to see it. And then the pressure builds. And I think now we're in this, you know, excuse the pun with the name of your uh, organization, but it's a bit of a tidal wave that is kind of yeah. coming across stuff and we're seeing it more and more. And do you really feel like the past few years you've really seen a lot more positive change and maybe before that you were kind of banging your head against the wall or, or have you, has it always been you've seen a lot of positive change? It's just that now that more people are seeing it. I mean, I've seen, you know, there's definitely been an acceleration and, you know, the Blue Planet effect, of course, um, has... Know, has has helped bring particularly the plastic pollution issue into people's households. And you know, David Attenborough is is possibly one of the most you know trusted voices in our country. So it's always good to have him supporting a cause. And we were very you know we were thrilled to be able to present him with a plastic free champion award um, earlier this year. Um, it, was my, it was my first meeting of the year to present him with that award. So it was a, a good start to 2020, a year that now has been derailed somewhat in in many other sort of ways. But, um, but yeah, we see more people doing it. You know, we've seen a proliferation. You know, when I took over in 2008, when we were always working on, already working on plastic pollution, we were mobilizing beach cleaners, we were collecting evidence, we were sending evidence back to corporations, we were tracking polluters on plastic. There were a handful of organizations working in this space, you know, two or three, four, you know, organizations who really, you know, thought about plastic pollution. And now, you know, there's a, a, a tidal wave of organizations that have formed in response to this, which is, is brilliant. You know, I celebrate it, you know, just seeing how many people are trying to approach the issue in different ways, how many people want to put their time and effort into this and run organizations and, and start new organizations and have, you know, a profile around the issue to try and drive change. So it's, it's brilliant. Um, so there's many, many more people, many, many more organizations, um, the public, I think are, are really receptive to it too. And I think broadly the world is starting to turn its you know, head collectively towards the fact that we live on a finite planet. Now the current crisis that we're in might accelerate that hopefully, to a place where people really think about the, the merits of how much they're consuming <clears throat> every year and whether it's morally correct to take so much um, in, a, in a sort of time when so little is available to so many. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned about David Attenborough. I was at Glastonbury Festival last year and he got up and spoke on the pyramid stage and the, the, the applause he gets, he's kind of, he's, he's, if you were to think of someone, you couldn't think of anyone probably more prominent in this country right now, people that would respect the most. And even all over the world, I spoke with someone uh, on this podcast who's over in New York and he was mentioning about how amazing Attenborough is and the impact them. But besides that, you've also got some other pretty prominent people involved, haven't you? You've got um, uh, some royal, royalty involved yeah. on your, um, one of your patrons. Yeah, we've got, I mean, we, well, our own, it's something he, the, 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 the Prince of Wales, his royal Highness, the Prince of Wales is our newly, newly, um, you know, recruited patron, um, our only sort of patron, our, you know, our, our patron. And, and that's amazing. You know, what, what more, sort of credible voice could we have somebody who's been talking about plastic pollution for 40 years pretty much somebody who's been talking about the need to radically protect nature for as long as that you know is 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 a, a such an authentic voice for us to have as as part of our charity we had a a lovely event with him um to welcome him as patron just a few weeks ago and i've i've sort of got to know um his royal highness over the past few years since 2015 um, when we first hosted a big event with him 
and started our journey with the, the sort of the, the royal sort of connections, which is, you know, which is brilliant. And there are lots of people out there who may not believe in, you know, monarchy may have different views, but he is, is, is a driving force behind so much in this space. Um, and we are very proud to have him as our, our patron. And, um, you know, he is also, if you look back across the years, someone who windsurfed and surfed um, uh, in his time, um, and is really passionate about the ocean. So yeah, we're honored and, and thrilled to have him as part of our, our organization and um, to be able to spend some, some time with him occasionally um, to uh, share the work that we're doing and, and get his advice and steer on the, uh, on the sort of big global uh, context of, of ocean protection. You're also supported by his son, I believe, and his wife, Prince Harry and Meghan. When they got married, you were one of the fortunate charities that got um, yeah. from donations. We we were we were we were so honored to have um to be selected as one of just seven charities from around the world to have a to have um you know, to be a you know an official charity of the of the wedding um, which which threw a light on us that we sort of never seen before and um, we reached billions of people around the world with our work through that which was the biggest you know big opportunity for us to talk about ocean conservation at such a high level and Personally, to be able to go along to Windsor Castle on the day and to spend time sort of doing interviews, talking about the work that we were doing as one of the selected charities was a, was a great privilege. It was, a, you know, the archetypal early summer day. Um, it was a, you know, blue, blue cobble, blue sky, sunshine from dawn till dusk, um, a light wind fluttering the, the, the royal insignia and flags around the, the grounds. Um, and such a such a sort of a beautiful event and a, a, a sort of a you know globally watched event so um so yeah it was a great great privilege and you know my work at ss has taken me to places sort of a you know above and beyond um you know some of my own sort of admittedly you know um you know um sort of optimistic and and uh driven sort of aspirations you know to to go to a, you know the 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 sort of royal wedding on the day to Royal Highness and have him as our patron to, to, to have the chance to meet and talk to David Attenborough on multiple occasions and work with some of the leading inspirational scientists, um, academics, campaigners, athletes, um, surfers, um, you know, adventurers um, and sort of business leaders that, that we have in the world today is, is a, a great honor. Um, and, I sort of believe it that it's because we're a very authentic charity where we lack resources of some of the really big mega charities. We have a, 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 an abundance of who as surfers ourselves, as people who use the ocean, as people who are based right next to the ocean. And we're, we're fully committed as a sleeves rolled up charity who gets stuck in um, from the beachfront right to the front benches of parliament. Yeah, and I just think when when you tell me that, I was, it was nice hearing about you going to Winter Castle. I was literally you, the way you explained that. I was literally in there as you were to tell me all that. It sounds it sounds incredible. Yeah. But I think on a personal level, listening to you talk and the passion that you've got, um, it must be such a privilege to know that when you're waking up each morning, you know you, what you're doing, you know the effect that you're having, the people that you're meeting, the the influence that you're having. Like, do you actually stop and sort of like reflect on that much to think, wow, you know what I'm. Because I know what it can be like. I speak to plenty of people who are on charities, and sometimes it's that thing. Um, you know, if you're an activist and stuff, it can be pretty tough. You know, you can feel like you're, you, you know, you're fighting a good fight, but it can be quite draining at times for some people. And do you ever look back as much, reflect, and go, you know, wow, you know, this is amazing what I'm doing and the results that we've had along yeah, the way. Yeah, I mean, I sort of try to, um, you know, and I, I, um, you know, I get moments. And I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I've got a very you know, I'm very grateful for the, the, the platform I have to be able to sort of do what I do. And, you know, we, I work really hard to, to maintain that. And of course, the public doesn't see a lot of the boring stuff we do, the spreadsheets, the, you know, the, the HR things we do, the, the, the systems we have to introduce, the planning we have to do. And they often see the really nice parts of it. So there are parts of it that are, you know, sort of more challenging. Um, there are also, you know, you, you can't always take everyone along on the journey with you too. So there's, you know, with anything where you have the sort of profile and the impact that we're very proud of having, 
there are always critics too. And so you develop a sort of an ecosystem around that. And I'm, I'm, I'm really comfortable with, with that. You know, I expect there to be critics. Whenever you're opinionated and you have to take a stance, there's going to be people who disagree with you. And that's fine. But I, I think my, my, my wife would say, I ne- my wife and my son would say, I never stop and I never switch off. Um, and that's true. And it's one of the things you also carry with you if you do something that you're really, really passionate about. Because it's hard to separate out your personal drive and passion for something with then your profession because they are one and the same so you see you see them just being intertwined throughout your days um and that is um that is great but it can be challenging at times when you go right i just need to stop and be just not not think about that right now but um but look i would I would never grumble about what I've done. I've, I've, I've worked really hard to sort of get here and I'm very proud of, of having a team, a brilliant team around me with, without whom I couldn't do it, but I couldn't do it without my trustees. I couldn't do it without the team around me who, who, who do the, you know, who are working equally as hard and passionately with, with the sort of issues. And, it, you know, again, it's great to have a, you know, you know, like-minded people driving in the same direction on an issue that the world really cares about at this time. So, so we're uh, we're very sort of fortunate. I think there are big challenges um, ahead. You know, the world is not in a good shape, and we've got big victories that we really need to fight harder for. Because you know, the plastic bags, the refilling of things, the some of the movement stuff we're doing, you know, needs to do much much more to really really change how you know change how nature can come back and thrive again so um so that's the mission we're on and it's all a it's all a sort of sequential thing you've got to bring people on a journey and sometimes it's little steps along the way sometimes there's big strides sometimes you slip back a bit and you have to pick yourself up and you have to jump forward and you have to find new ways of doing things so as a campaigner you have to be optimistic you have to believe you can achieve what you want to see and you'll find a way to, to deliver you know the, the work you want to see delivered ultimately. Um, I paraphrase a, 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 one of my sort of inspirational, um, sort of one of my inspirations, an author called Tim Winton, but he once said to me that, you know, you, as a campaigner, you've got to have the courage to, to work on what you're working on, even if you may never see the results of that, if you're just m- moving things in the right direction. And I think that's true. Um, I think we've got to, you know, be, to invest our time and understand that, you know, you may never see the forest that you're, planting grow into you know 40 foot high trees but you know you've done the planting and that somebody's going to manage that forest and look after it for you when you can't do that anymore so i think you've got to play your role whilst you're active you're able whilst you've got the energy drive and and in you know sort of um the 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 faculties to do that um and um you mustn't forget to switch off too work too hard all the time you can't be that effective you've got to go surfing you've got to ride your bike you've got to draw your inspiration you've got to stop and throw the rugby ball out around in the street with your your kids you've got to um do some cooking and 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 switch off in other ways so you've got to find your 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 moments of silence um, and moments of um, regeneration yeah um yeah incredible some inspiring words in there what what first got you into this then but was, it, like, was there any sort of seeds when you were in your childhood? Oh, for me, I, I mean, I was, <laughs> so it was a bit, I was probably a bit of a, like a, like a, a, a little freak, really, at, at school with my collection of things in my room, shells and rocks and birds' eggs and nets and things I found in nature, all catalogued and labelled up on my shelves in my room, my, my mini library of, natural history books and and scientific books um my collection of reptiles and 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 other animals you know all of those things that i had you know i've always been thrilled by the nature around me and to this day you know if i'm on a walk with my family and we see a you know you know a sparrow hawk or a deer or whatever you know that is a, a, a huge moment of excitement for us collectively and i i find that so rewarding um and it almost can jolt you from from complacency to excitement or from a bad mood to a good mood, all of those sorts of things. So, so I, I really thrive off, off, off seeing nature and, and, and being around it. I'm also a passionate sort of sports. I was a, a runner as a, a kid, but I, I found sort of surfing 
<clears throat> when I was in sort of my early teens, really. And and uh, the, the the combination and the uh, and the sort of rewards it gives you. So it's a sport, you know, despite sort of wave pools and things these days. I mean, the fundamental essence of the sport is you you sort of toil for for your reward. You you have to understand the weather, the conditions. You've got to keep going to the beach. You've got to get to understand the environment around you to then line yourself up on that day when the waves are really perfect and to get the one or few perfect waves you might get on that day. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of investment you've got to put into that. So it's a quite a sort of a discipline and, and sort of a lot of good things in life are about that sort of investment to the process, you know, the scarcity of something and how you've got to find a way to sort of get to that. And surfing is a good example of that and a metaphor for life of, you know, you've got to, you've got to put your time in, you might go to the beach and the wind might be wrong. The swell might be wrong. You might not be able to, then you might have a bad surf, but you've got to keep on keeping on. You've got to see that as part of the process. And actually, it's the process that's rewarding because, because all of that builds up in your sort of mind and then you get the, the reward. And you know, if things are too easy, you know, they, they're, they're less rewarding naturally, you know, um, and, um, and you, need to, you need to invest your sort of time and energies in, in crafting, crafting a great result. So, um, Surfing's surfing's great, and it's a it's a passion for me. Um, I'm not a very good surfer. I love I love surfing. I can ride waves. I ride with my friends. I have my favourite spots here in Cornwall and further afield. But I um, but I think it you know it doesn't matter how good or bad you are at something, whether it's surfing or running or whatever. It's your own personal reward mechanism with it. So people shouldn't compare themselves with you know great athletes or whatever. They should go like, what is the what is the feeling it gives you? How do, how does how do you come out? Don't compare yourself to other people. Just compare yourself to the feeling that you want to achieve. And that's it. Yeah, that's really well said. And are you able to do much surfing at the moment on lockdown? Is it, is it, well, I'm not even allowed to go. I mean, I live in, in, in Truro in Cornwall and, and I can go, I can ride my bike into the woods here. And I saw a deer yesterday morning. I saw, um, um, what did I see? Um, this morning woodpeckers and all sorts of things. That's a nice thing, but I don't live close enough to the beach to walk to it. I'm not really allowed to go, although I had to pop to the office today to sign some contracts and um, it's by the, the beach up in St. Agnes and I went for a walk around the headland and the sea was looking spectacular. Not great waves today, but um, it was nice just to see it, to get a bit of that ocean feeling. Um, but um, I don't get in as much as I'd like at the moment. I had a surf last week before the lockdown really started on the Monday. I surfed at my favourite spot, Druskin, um, which um, which was good. I, I surfed on a board that I built last summer with a, a, an artisan called James Otter. Um, and it's made out of locally sourced timber and uh, it rides exceptionally well. And I had some very nice waves on it. It was a, it was a, it was a good surf. So that will stick in my mind for the next couple of weeks and hopefully we'll get the opportunity to get outside um, soon. Um, but we'll see. That sounds great. So you, is the office generally when you, you know, on normal circumstances, it's close to the beach, is it? Yeah, that's right. I, I, I overlook this. We overlook the sea, so we're right by the beach. And, uh, you know, there's a sort of a good surf spot down the hill from us. You can be from desk to water in probably in 15 minutes, less than 15 minutes if you really want to, and you run down the hill. Um, but, um, but yeah, we, we've been busy. It, Surfing in any normal day is, is quite challenging to squeeze in, but we if there's if there's really a good run of waves, you know, you've got to make it your business to to get in at some stage. Um, of course, the the evenings are now lighter. The summer, the summer timetable is here, which which expands your surfing opportunities no end. So I'm looking forward to well, you know, most of all, you know, of course, in this global crisis, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, you know, there's much bigger bigger things for people to worry. about than whether they can go surfing or not, including, you know, myself. And I think about the people who are really at the, 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 the sharp end of the, the, the crisis at the moment. But, um, but when it passes, which it will, you know, like any storm, um, you know, I, I hope that I can get in more. And I'm going to reset myself a bit, you know. I want to make sure that, that I, I spend a bit more time on that personal sort of space of doing what I love to do. Because I don't believe anyone can be be effective whether they're working on something that they're passionate about or not you need you need to take the downtime you need to sleep and you need to do the things you love and spend the time switched off from your work so when you do work that you're fully fully energized to deliver the result it's not always about how much time you put in it's 
about the the ultimate impact and result you want to get out. Yeah, um, I talk about a lot on this podcast about self care. You know, we need to we need to spend enough time looking after ourselves because then, you know, you it fuels you for actually going in the day. I think I, I remember yeah. hearing about. Um, Elon Musk on his 50th birthday, he basically just celebrated by working 24 hours straight. Now, obviously he's incredibly productive and does some phenomenal things, but I wonder whether there's, you know, there's, and I don't want to certainly want to be criticizing someone who's, who's doing that to what he's been doing, but I think it's maybe a bit of an old mentality thinking work more, get more out when actually if you, if we take care of ourselves a bit more, like I know when I'm, if I'm in a good place, like, you know, I'll, I'll take some time each morning, whether it's meditation, exercise mm. running that will fill me up and charge me when in the afternoon I could what I could do in three or four hours I could it would potentially take me eight to ten hours mm. on a day when I'm not in that good space yeah I know what you mean and I, I, I'm probably of your mindset I mean I would I, I'd always sort of sort of caution against um assuming that one model is right for everyone so you know Elon might find himself the most relaxed when he's working 24 hours a day on the, the innovations that he wants to deliver and that might be his thing Quite and that's possibly. fine and like i think society should be open to the fact that there are people who work in crazy ways who do brilliant things who might just thrive in that space and who might be really stressed out you know sat at home or going for a walk or going surfing they might just go look i'm it's not the thing for me um and that's also sort of cool and but I think predominantly people need a balance and they need to have moments of recharging and switching off. Um, people need to, to be focused, as you say, when they need to be focused. And they can achieve a lot more when they've, they've, they're, they're, they're refreshed, when they've slept well, when they've eaten well, when they've spent the time switched off. They can, they can be more effective when they're switched on. So I agree with you. But I you know, also take it that some people just, just naturally want to just work all of the time. I'm not sure. I think, you know, it's an, an old sort of, no, it's the same, but you know, I don't think anyone generally says on their deathbed that they wish they had spent more time at work. There's lots of cases of people saying they wish they had spent more time with their children or their parents or their family, their friends, or doing something they loved, or they wish that they had learned to surf or learned to play badminton better or whatever it was. But not a lot of people say that they wish they had spent more time at work. And you've got to remember, however, however, you know, I suppose self-aggrandizing or arrogant an individual can be, you know, somebody will always come along and do our work after us. You know, you have a shelf life, no matter how good you are at what you do, and somebody will come and do it after you. So you've got to be relaxed about that too. Some, you know, you can't, you know, people are very competitive and individualistic in this day and age. And, you know, they sort of see, you know, they guard their spaces quite fiercely often. And, and actually, you know, somebody's coming along and you've got to be, got to be accepting of that you can't you can't do everything things will change there'll be things out of your control and uh and ultimately you will move on from what you're doing too at some stage so enjoy the ride whilst you're on it try and have the most effective impact you can whatever that is whether you're you know doing frontline work and you know brilliant work of the nhs or the supermarket staff or whatever at the moment or whether you're you've know, got good fortune of working in you know the conservation industry or anything else you know it's uh you know, it's, um, yeah, it's uh, important you, 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 uh, you recognise that it's, it's, all got a, it's all got a time frame to it and uh, you've, got to, you've got to reconcile yourself with that. Yeah, one of the best examples that I think about of people who have um, reflected on this in a deep way in terms of is Steve Jobs. You know, he, he massive, you know, incredible what he built up, but then he wrote a letter, didn't he, when he was close to death and he really outlined that. You know, he might have 10, 12 billion, but the billions don't love him back. He does, he's not going to get that time back that he didn't spend with his family. So um, like you say, it's balance. It's get, definitely getting the balance right. Look, as a parent of a, a 12-year-old boy, who's just, you know, going through the strangest year of his life now, um, as we all are. Um, you know, it was a, it's quite, a, quite a sort of uh, an interesting time when you come to that realisation. Um, where you suddenly realise the childhood, you know, in its in its sort of small sense, is over. You suddenly go, there are no more toys, Legos, no more. It's not interesting anymore. That will never happen again. These are things that he will never do again. And you see the end of a chapter. And so, you know, it, it makes me all the more sort of grateful 
time I've been able to spend with my son and with my wife and, and make me reflect on how important this time is now. So some things have stopped, but I've, you know, I've got a, I've got a 12 year old um, boy who's at home and he's my support and counsel. He wants to now play rugby with me or throw his plane around outside or go surfing or go riding his bike. And you've got to, you've got to hold on to those moments because they come and they go and they've also got a shelf life to them. So you can't say, oh, I'll, I'll do that next year or I'll do it. You know, I'll get around to that. I've just got to, now right it's like, you don't get another chance. You know, there is one Christmas day for your children on their first year, their second year, the third year. There isn't another time to play out the sixth Christmas again. It's a one time only offer for these moments in their lives. Yeah, there definitely is, isn't there? In all our lives, you know, to make those moments count. I know, yeah, I know. I think we can always think in our mind that we should be doing more. Like, for instance, yourself, what you're doing, you know, you're always thinking you could be doing more. There's, there's, more, there's always more work to do. And yeah. it's realizing that I mean, it doesn't all have to be done today. You know, it can. No. You know, let's, and especially now, what's going on, um, a lot of us can't do what we could. Like, um, I, out of the seven things that I would normally be actively doing, you know, five of them have just been pulled from me. So yeah, now the yeah. focus is now on basically on them too, but actually I can probably do them two things a lot better now, but also yeah. I can just feel like I don't have the pressure that's, that's been on me with other stuff. Totally, but yeah. We'll see. Totally. Well, now I'm you. you know, it's a really interesting time, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a middle-aged man and, and, um, and it's an interesting time to re- reflect too, you know, on, on life priorities and, you know, it's, it isn't a dress rehearsal. We're all, we're all here and, you know, we've got to try and just, you know, li- live a good life for ourselves and for others. Be kind to people, be understanding, be tolerant, try and share opportunities, try and be supportive of your friends, family, community, you know, do good things. And, and um, yeah, I think people always like people who are nice and open and friendly. You see, you know, if you come into an office and you've got a good attitude, and, you know, you'll, you'll always respond to people with, positive attitudes you know won't you so. yeah absolutely well i know that you've got um you've got a few things to get on with today so i won't keep you keep you much longer but what's you know what's the best way for people to get involved with sas like well, we're a, you know we're a really inclusive and open organization um and when life gets back to normal and um, there'll be lots of activities people can do with us from coming to camp campaign in westminster with with us to running beach cleans to being part of our you know the hundreds of plastic free communities we've got around. We've got a great plastic free schools program, you know, all sorts of, um, all sorts of things. Um, you know, the best way at the moment for people to get involved is come to our website, sas.org.uk, sign up for our e-newsletter. You'll get regular updates, ways you can digitally campaign with us, ways you can be an ocean activist with us and, um, and take a journey. You don't have to be a surfer. You don't have to be interested in sewage. You, if you're, you're passionate about the ocean if you've been to the ocean and want to see it better protected hopefully we've got something for you that sounds great well that's um yeah i'll be, I'll be sure to include the links and stuff to everyone so they can check you guys out um, right. but um no i've really enjoyed chatting with you today hugo and uh, you too thanks very more. much for the opportunity no you yeah, haven't just finding out more about the organization and also just you you know as well hearing about your journey because i think it's really important that you know people might see where somebody's at now but it, there's a process to it and like you yeah. were talking about, it's very interesting here about your childhood, like you used the words that like you're a little bit of a, you know, a freak, you know, yeah. collecting all these things. But it's interesting how those, those things sow the seeds for you later in life. So if someone is, is in a particular path or doing something with a life now that they're not particularly satisfied in, sometimes it's good for us to, to go back and remember the things that we really enjoyed to do as a child. What yeah. were some of the dreams that we had that we maybe didn't see through? Totally. And I think potentially Definitely. now with what's going on, you know, a lot of people are going to lose their jobs and that's not going to be great in, in, in the next, you know, the short term, but who mm-hmm. knows how that might actually steer people in a different direction. Cause they'll think yeah. I wasn't necessarily yeah. doing that anyway. So yeah, but yeah, it's been a pleasure speaking to you and I really appreciate it. Right. Hugo. So, um, well, look, thanks a lot. And yeah, yeah. Keep safe. So there we have it guys. There's today's episode with Hugo Tagom all wrapped up from SAS, you know, really inspiring guy. 
doing some incredible work uh, to help the environment. Who, who's not going to uh, like that? But if you enjoyed it, please share this episode with a friend. I really appreciate it. The links to do with this podcast and to SAS, I'll include them in the show notes so you can check them out. And, you know, as well, if you um, uh, listen to this on Apple or podcast, please leave me a review. I'd really appreciate that. And if you listen to it on YouTube, then you can please give it a like and subscribe. That go a long way. And also as well, if you really want to support the podcast a little bit step further, then my Patreon page is available and you can help to support this podcast to help me continue to be putting out interesting episodes for you. So um, yeah, all good. There's many ways to help support me. So anyway, guys, until next time, have a good one.